Yes, I'm going to talk about the incredibly large topic of wastewater from energy extraction and utilization. There are many, many ways that wastewater from energy extraction and utilization could affect our drinking water systems and our risk. So this topic really should be subtitled, The Unexpected Role of Bromide. Because what I'm going to talk about is all about the issue of bromide. And for those of you who have worked with bromide, perhaps as a hydrologic tracer, it may strike you as unexpected that there is any negative impact to bromide in the environment since you routinely release it, release it as a tracer. So this talk will surprise some of you because bromide is a significant public health challenge when it's released into the environment where it affects drinking water plants. I'm going to start very high level before I drill down into that, just to remind you that energy extractive industries use a significant amount of water and produce a significant amount of wastewater. So this is a hydraulic fracturing activity in the Marcellus Shale Formation. This particular one's in West Virginia. It does use about a million gallons per hydraulic fracture. That technology, hydraulic fracturing and um, locational directional drilling, has really enabled the extraction of gas from shale formations that are tight. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about this, but this is actually not the big driver for bromide problems nationally in the US. The other big piece to understand is that once we extract that fossil fuel, either extract the coal or extract the natural gas, then predominantly what we do with that resource is burn it for electricity generation. That generation process, the utilization of that fossil fuel, also uses a significant amount of water and produces a significant amount of wastewater. So both the extraction and the utilization have water quantity and quality impacts. Wastewaters associated with these two activities are routinely discharged to the environment. Across the top here are wastewater discharges from coal-fired power plants. There are significant numbers and different types of wastewater discharges from power plants. Across the bottom are wastewater discharges from oil and gas development. It is illegal in the United States to directly discharge wastewater at an oil and gas site. And so this water is trucked to either disposal or treatment followed by discharge. On the right here is a discharge into the Allegheny River Basin, which I'm going to talk about today. So this is trucked either to municipal wastewater treatment plants, that's a municipal authority where this water is largely just diluted with other wastes, or trucked to a centralized brine treatment plant where it is treated to remove the most concerning elements, but not bromide. That water which is discharged into the environment then becomes a source water for drinking water plants. So wastewater plants discharge and they call them receiving waters. Drinking water plants call them source waters. You might call them rivers, right? That's all the same water. At the drinking water plant, that water is extracted. We remove lots of different contaminants and we disinfect. Most important thing to know about drinking water treatment of fresh water is that it does not involve desalination. No one desalinates a fresh water source. You would only desalinate, remove simple monovalent ions if you're treating a salt water. So desalination, not part of conventional treatment, but disinfection is. Disinfection is probably the most important process we do in drinking water from a stability and human health standpoint. So we take that source water and we treat it, remove lots of things, add disinfection, and deliver it to you. Chemical disinfectants, often based on chlorine, are applied to kill the microorganisms in the water. That's a good thing. Please don't leave here today and tell anyone I told you not to chlorinate the water. Okay, chlorination, good. Okay. Unfortunately, chlorination, when it interacts with chemicals that exist in that surface water, produces the unintended consequence of disinfection byproducts, or DBPs. The precursors that generally form DBPs are dissolved organic carbon and some inorganic constituents, bromide, iodide, and nitrogen. DBPs have their own health risks. They're associated with negative reproductive outcomes like miscarriage and low birth weight and with cancer, particularly bladder cancer. That's clearly a bad thing, right? Disinfection good, disinfection byproducts bad. We're always balancing the need to disinfect with the difficulty of managing disinfection byproducts. That's not news. I could have given that talk 20 years ago. What's interesting and what's news associated with the energy associated discharges is this role of bromide. Again, we have always known that bromide has a significant effect on brominated disinfection byproducts. It's not complicated, right? You can't get a disinfection byproduct that has bromide in it unless you had some bromide somewhere. So if the source water has bromide, you're likely to get brominated disinfection byproducts. When that bromide increases, we see an increase 
in the mass of disinfection byproducts that contain bromine. Those brominated DBPs are more of a concern than chlorinated DBPs. So this is some work, Yang et al. from 2014 out of Michael Pleva's lab at the University of Illinois, looking at the cytotoxicity and genotoxicity of chlorinated, brominated, and iodated DBPs. And as you can see, brominated DBPs are significantly more carcinogenic and teratogenic than the chlorinated analogs. So bromine-containing DBPs are something we want to avoid. All DBPs we'd like to avoid, but particularly bromine-containing DBPs. So where's that bromide from, and how much bromide is there anyway? So in the late 1990s in the US, the EPA put out an information collection rule which collected a whole bunch of information about disinfection byproduct formation in drinking water plants serving large populations. One of the things they asked is how much bromide is in your source water. And so we have a historical data set from 1997 and 1998 on bromide concentrations in the US. I've rolled them up here to the watershed level rather than showing you the individual drinking water plants. The most important take home here, it varies across the different regions. And the median for all surface water sources in the US in 1998 was 30 micrograms per liter. I need you to keep that number in mind, 30 micrograms per liter. That's how much we expect to have in a source water in the US. Now, 1998 was not a time that we were not affected by the kind of discharges I'm going to talk about today, because they were happening in 1998, but they were much smaller than they are now. OK, so where does that bromide come from? Well, I always tell my students that bromide is on the periodic table, in case they didn't know. And that means that it's an element. It exists in the world, and it's not going anywhere. Right? It's going to move around. You can incorporate it in organic things. You can incorporate it in inorganic things. But it's staying put on the planet. Bromide starts in the crust. And so it's not unexpected that you would see some bromide from mineral dissolution and from leaching from soils. It's present in the ocean, and so ocean sea spray contains bromide. It's present in ocean water, so groundwater intrusion often adds bromide to our drinking water sources when we're pumping wells. But the anthropogenic sources are what I'm going to talk about today, and those are associated with fossil fuel extraction. So road application of brines, this is very common a lot of places in the country. Oil and grass, gas brines are used on rural roads for dust control. Coal piles leach a significant amount of bromide, and coal-fired power plants and oil and gas discharges, which are the ones I'm going to talk about today. So lots of sources of bromide, but the anthropogenic ones are the ones I'm interested in and have been studying. To give you some context, back thinking about that 30 micrograms per liter being the average bromide in, the, um, in water sources in the US in the late 1990s, I wanted to take a look at the bromide concentrations in some of these other um, sources. So this is a log plot of bromide in milligrams per liter. Here are those US source waters. This is now all source waters, groundwater and surface water. Almost all source waters are below 100 micrograms per liter. The median surface water was 30. Here are the oil and gas produced waters up here, somewhere between 200 and 1,000 or 2,000 um, milligrams per liter of bromide. So these are significantly enriched compared to source waters and compared to other natural water systems. One thing I want you to notice very carefully here is that Marcellus shale gas-produced water, conventional gas-produced water, oil well-produced water, and the effluent from a brine treatment plant are not in any way different. Okay? Brine treatment plants do not remove brine. Okay? Brine treatment plants remove lots of stuff that's in the water, but they don't do anything to remove the bromide, so that's still in the effluent. Coal-fired wastewater power plants are actually a lower concentration of bromide from the sort of 50 to 100 and dominated by the coal wastewater itself at the power plant, not so much from coal mine discharges. So we're talking about many orders of magnitude higher concentrations of bromide in these wastewaters than we expect to find in our surface waters. I have, a thing, I have two slides on oil and gas produced water because the take home message from oil and gas produced water is don't put it in the river. Everybody got that? Oil and gas produced water is rarely discharged even after treatment, except in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, where I'm from, we think this is a good idea. And so when the Marcellus Shale development happened in sort of the mid, um, around 2008, 2006 was like the first well. 2008, we had a boom of shale production out of the Marcellus formation. That top bar is the unconventional wastewater being produced in the state. 
bottom bar is the conventional wastewater. So not much change in conventional produced water, but a significant uptick in unconventional produced water. We did not have very many places to take this to. So this went to a lot of surface discharging plants where the bromide was not removed. It was applied, um, liberally applied to roads, probably more than necessary for dust control. Um, as a result of that, a whole bunch of us did a lot of studies where we said this is a terrible idea. You should really stop doing this. Okay. I'm not going to talk too much more about it because for the most part, unconventional wastewater is no longer treated this way in Pennsylvania. Okay. Different story when you talk about power plants. Power plants, it's very common for them to have NPDES, National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permits that allow them to discharge wastewater to the environment. That wastewater contains bromide because of a very unusual constellation of things. First of all, bromide is present in coal. That's not surprising, right? Coal was mined from the subsurface. It was produced by the compression of organic matter, much of which was of ocean origin and contained um, ions like bromide and chloride. Not surprising, the coal itself has bromide. Different coals have different amounts of bromide, different groupings of coals, and also at the individual level of an individual mine, we'll see different amounts of bromide. Bromide in coal in southwestern Pennsylvania is unusually high. If there's a theme to this whole problem, it's that southwestern Pennsylvania really got hit hard by a lot of these issues. It's particularly high in southwestern Pennsylvania because the coal produced there was from an old inland sea, not from, we're very, we're very far from the ocean now, but at the time the coal was being produced, we were an inland sea. One of the things we noticed about bromide in coal was that if you burned a high bromide coal, you released less mercury to the environment out the stack. Interestingly enough, as soon as engineers figured that out, they said, you know what'll work? I bet I could just add a lot of bromide to your low bromide coal. We are so smart, right? <laughs> bromide addition will enhance mercury removal at your coal-fired power plant. And this is not a really detailed technology. You solubilize calcium bromide and you spray it on the coal. Okay? The loading doesn't have to be very exact. The measurement doesn't have to be very exact. And at least in the state of Pennsylvania, you don't have to tell anyone you're doing it. <laughs> calcium bromide is not a chemical additive. I know the chemists in the room would disagree, but it's not a chemical additive according to PADEP, the Department of Environmental Protection. So you can add as much bromide as you would like to your coal. Now, the US government got in the business too. They thought, well, that's a great idea. You know, if adding bromide to coal is going to help with mercury, maybe it helps with some other things too, like NOx and SOx. And sure enough, refining coal under certain conditions, adding bromide, iodide, and some other metals, will reduce NOx emissions, SOx emissions, and mercury. The US government thought this was such a good idea that they invented a tax credit. This tax credit allows companies who are unrelated to the coal plant itself to buy the coal from the mine, treat it with this refining chemical, and ship it to the coal um, fire power plant to use. If they do that, they get this great tax credit. With the help of this coal tax credit, Mylan, those are the people who make the EpiPens, had a negative 294% tax rate in 2016. I know you're going to ask me why Mylan is involved in coal, and they aren't, of course. They don't touch any of this process. This is a packaged tax credit which they take advantage of. And finally, although I won't talk about it today, bromide is sometimes added to cooling tower water because bromine as a disinfectant is more stable than chlorine at um, high temperatures. OK, so we got all that bromide. Now you might think, well, there's no reason that should be in the wastewater. That bromide that I apply to the coal goes into the coal firing and ends up going up the stack. And you would be right. HBr and Br2 are released through the stack unless you thought sulfur dioxide and acid rain were a problem and you deployed a flue gas desulfurization system at your power plant. If you were trying to control those airborne emissions, of course, first you added the bromide because that was really good for mercury control, but then you added this scrubber. If you add the scrubber, the scrubber captures, of course, the sulfur, and it also incidentally and unintentionally captures the bromide. So in systems that are applying flue gas desulfurization and adding bromide, all of that bromide ends up in the river. You might wonder, given that, if we regulate that discharge, 
since I told you that bromide's bad for the drinking water plant, it creates these carcinogenic disinfection byproducts, so maybe we limit people from discharging bromide from coal-fired power plants. You know we don't, right? I mean, we don't even limit them from discharging arsenic and selenium. Why would we worry about bromide, right? Coal-fired power plant discharges are limited in something called the Steam Electric Power Plant Effluent Limitation Guidelines. Those are guidelines that apply to all steam electric power plants. They were written in the 1980s, promulgated in 1986. Recently, in 2015, a revision was promulgated that now will not allow them to discharge arsenic and selenium and lots of other horrible things. That was a good idea, too. It didn't say anything about bromide. Despite the fact that a number of us in the drinking water field sent comments to the EPA at the time saying, you know, bromide's a real problem. Here's what it said. Depending on site-specific conditions and applicable state water quality standards, it may be appropriate for permitting authorities to establish water quality-based effluent limitations on bromide, especially where steam electric power plants are located upstream of drinking water intake. It also had this really interesting phrase I meant to put on here that said, the discharge permit writers and the drinking water industry permit writers will collaborate to figure out that number. I've never seen those two groups collaborate, but I loved that that was in a reg. Like, we were really going to instruct them to collaborate. So this came out in 2015. It's actually been stayed, so the timeline for compliance is pushed out, and EPA has announced that they're planning to revise the revision to the ELGs. But at the time that it came out, my graduate students and I looked at this and said, well, nobody we know will know how to do that. Right? That's a great idea. You might want to establish a water quality-based effluent standard based on state water quality standards, there are no state water quality standards for bromide, and based on whether or not the power plants are located upstream from the drinking water plants, does anybody even know? So this was the problem we sought to answer. What would you do if the drinking water plant was downstream of the electric power plant, and could you determine how much of an impact the bromide was having? So we started with a very big national analysis, looking at where the power plants were, so there were 325 total coal-fired power plants operating in 2016 in the United States. That is down from previous years. Coal plants have been closing. 140 of them, the one shown as blue triangles here, operate wet flue gas desulfurization. If you squint, you'll be able to tell that the blue triangles tend to be bigger than the red and gray triangles. Large coal-fired power plants choose wet flue gas desulfurization. That's an economic choice, but it is a sunk cost at these facilities. So telling these facilities to switch back from wet to dry is not going to work. One of my early briefings of EPA, at EPA, they said, wait, wait, if you had told us this 10 years ago, we would have told them all to deploy dry FGD. And I said, yes, had I known this 10 years ago when I was a baby, I would have come and I would have told you this. But I didn't know this unintended consequence was going to happen in wet FGD, neither did EPA. A number of those plants also burn refined coal. That's this coal to which bromide has been added. So 46 of the power plants um, that have wet FGD are burning refined coal. Um, 20, so 46 burn refined coal, 23 both burn refined coal and have wet FGD. It's actually slightly more than half the coal being burned because, again, these are bigger plants. OK, so the first thing my student said was, well, this will be easy. I will go to every one of those power plants and I will look at the reported bromide concentration in the discharge. Okay. And then I will know exactly how much bromide is coming from those power plants. Except that bromide is an unregulated chemical in the environment, so no power plant is actually measuring bromide concentration. And the FGD wastewater is also unregulated. There's no specific call out for FGD wastewater, so it is mixed with coal ash wastewater and other wastewaters at the facility and discharged. Across those plants we looked at, the vast majority of the plants, the wet FGD wastewater is less than 5% of the discharge from a given NPDES permitted discharge pipe. So even if I was going to measure the bromide, I would not be getting the bromide associated with that particular wet FGD. And it wouldn't be all that easy. This is a facility we went and measured at. It was not that easy to get to that NPDES permitted outfall, and we probably weren't supposed to be there. So in the absence of any effluent monitoring data, we estimate the loads. The load estimate in this case, I'm not going to be able to go into a lot of the details, but this is a Monte Carlo analysis from a lot of data available for coal deliveries. So first we look at how much coal gets delivered to the power plant on a monthly basis. We look at where that coal is from. 
We look at the type of coal. With the type of coal, we know the distribution of bromide concentration in different types of coal. We make an estimate for how much bromide they might add if they were going to comply with either MATS, that's the mercury control standard, or section 45 if they were trying to get a tax credit. And then we look at the percent of bromide that is captured in the wet FTD stream. We do all of that to estimate a load because there is no flow and concentration measurement that we could just multiply. Right? Okay, so all of this was developed to estimate the load from a power plant. I want to show you that work in one particular watershed, and then I'll blow it back up and we'll talk um, nationally. In the Allegheny watershed, which is the watershed that provides drinking water to the city of Pittsburgh, um, that's in um, Pennsylvania, which is on the eastern seaboard of the United States. The Allegheny watershed combines with the Monongahela watershed, which comes up from West Virginia. They form the confluence of the Ohio, which then runs 1,400 kilometers to the Mississippi. Okay, so this is the headwaters of the Ohio River, also part of the headwater system for the Mississippi. The yellow squares here are drinking water utilities. The blue triangles are, again, our coal-fired power plants. And the stars are oil and gas facilities that are treating brine but not removing bromide. So at this particular drinking water intake, we looked at the wet FTD bromide loads. We estimated those just as I've already said with all of those different parameters using a Monte Carlo to estimate the uncertainty associated with that outcome. And then the oil and gas produced waters, we also had some challenges in estimating. There is DMR, discharge monitoring data for those discharges. It reports flow and salt content, TDS. We had some estimates for the amount of bromide in that salt, and we used those. And then we did a non-point source analysis as well. In this region, at that drinking water intake, we then could predict the loads for each of those sources for each month. So here the non-point is gray, the oil and gas wastewater is orange, and the wet FTD is blue. Now we have an idea of going into this watershed, what's the total mass of bromide entering the system? But actually the drinking water plant doesn't care about the mass entering the system. The drinking water plant cares about the concentration at their intake. And concentration is not just about mass, it's also about flow. So there's bromide from other sources. There's the bromide from these wet FGD discharges. It goes into the river where it's diluted in a highly variable way, dependent on the flow in the river. And then we get to that downstream intake where the impact, the rate and extent of formation of DBPs is controlled by the concentration of the bromide at the intake. So of course, we took all of those loads. We used the flow information for the period of record at this location. The gauge is actually quite close to the drinking water intake. Um, lovely time to visit Pittsburgh is in the summer, as you can probably tell. Lower flow in the river is because it isn't raining every single day. In March and April, it rains a lot. Um, but in the summer, we have these low flow conditions. So for each of our month of loads, we then used this month of flows, again, a Monte Carlo analysis, to estimate the concentration at the intake. The predicted, that's our model, that's the black dots. The range there is the range of that uncertainty propagated through all of those different uncertain data sets. The X here is the observed data. That range is because they were measuring bromide every single day of the month. So that is the 30-day range. Did pretty good. We were actually astonished. We originally put this in the supplemental information for the paper, and the reviewers told us we were bearing the lead. The model worked, was apparently sufficient that we should put this in the real paper. We were actually much more interested in the implications of the model, but yes, the model worked. And in this basin, about a third, about 40 micrograms per liter under low flow conditions in August is due to this, oil, this um, coal-fired power plant discharge. More of it is due to oil and gas. I want to draw your attention to two points, 50 micrograms per liter, which this utility almost always exceeds and 100 micrograms per liter, which it exceeds during the summertime. Remember the median value in 1998? 30, right? Okay, so this utility is nowhere near 30. It's fifth, above 50 almost all of the time and above 100 quite a bit. When we first reported this kind of result, both for the Allegheny and the Monongahela, I got an immediate call from PADEP. Oh, gosh, gosh. You have to tell people that these are very low concentrations and no one could be hurt. Now, I didn't disagree that these are very low concentrations. It's 50 to 100 micrograms per liter. How could that possibly matter? 
So here's the drinking water utility. And this is not work I did. This is work Stanley States did at that utility, measuring bromide every single day. So these are bromide concentrations. Measuring their total trihalomethane concentration. That's the DBPs that form. That's vertical on the left in micrograms per liter. And it's the black dots. Brominated THM, where the amount of that total trihalomethane that's brominated is plotted on the right as a percentage. And that's those red dots. So here's 50. At 50, the TTHM concentration is uh, somewhere between 80 and 100. 80 is the regulatory compliance point. Okay, so at 80, we're too high. At 100, we're way up above 100 for our TTHM concentration. And more importantly, at 100, we are more than 50% brominated. Despite the fact that those brominated DBPs are more of a concern than the chlorinated, they are not separately regulated. Being 100% brominated in your TTHM is not a violation of the Safe Drinking Water Act. It's just a really, really bad idea. Okay. And so these bromide concentrations in the river were certainly contributing to problems at this drinking water intake. OK, I have to go much more quickly now. We told the DEP about the oil and gas problems, and they made it go away. That's all this slide says. The um, produced water that was going to exempt centralized treatment facilities was this 44% in 2010, and it's a negligible tiny little amount in 2012. That is largely because we talked about this, and, and um, the Water and Sewer Authority talked about this and said this is a big problem. DEP did not change the regulations. They politely asked the oil and gas producers to stop doing this, and the oil and gas producers said yes. They said, OK, we don't want to be any part of this. So the oil and gas wastewaters left this system, which led us to our next question. In fact, the only reason we were thinking about the power plants, because the problem didn't go away. We made the impact we wanted to make. We told the DEP. We told the drillers. Everybody agreed oil and gas produced water shouldn't go into the watersheds. And the bromide concentrations didn't come down. This is Pennsylvania's watersheds. I want to show you the Pennsylvania analysis pretty quickly. Here are Pennsylvania's power plants. Here are Pennsylvania's drinking water plants. Here are Pennsylvania's drinking water plants that are downstream of a power plant with wet FGD. So we identified nine wet FGD plants, six of them in Pennsylvania, three of them in West Virginia. Um, just a reminder, the Monongahela flows from south to north. So the Monongahela here is flowing up towards the point in Pittsburgh where it meets the Allegheny and forms the Ohio. So these three power plants, which are not under the control of the Pennsylvania DEP, but rather the West Virginia DEP, um, are causing most of the trouble for these water utilities in the Monongahela River. 21 drinking water intakes serving about 2.5 million people. There are about 16 million people in Pennsylvania. 8 million of them are on surface water. 2.5 million of them are downstream of a, a um, power plant um, releasing uh, FGD wastewater. Same load model. Every single power plant, where did the coal come from? How much bromide is in it? These are median values now. I'm not showing the uncertainty. Stacked bromide loads for each drinking water utility. So here's mine. Drinking water utility four is the one I drink from. Five is the one I just showed you all of the data for. There are four power plants upstream of that drinking water intake. And they vary in size. And they vary in the type of coal they burn. And so they have different bromide loads. Not surprisingly, the Ohio bromide load combines the Allegheny and the Monongahela. This is an excellent introductory engineering problem. Right? Mass is conserved, not concentration. Right? So the mass adds up. But the concentration in the Ohio River we would actually expect to be quite a bit lower because it's such a high flow river. Right? So these are our loads. We can identify the load associated with each power plant. That gets us closer to the idea that you could do a permit prescription, right? You could identify how much bromide is coming from each and every one of these power plants in the state of Pennsylvania. Because the concentration matters, not the load, we then had to take those loads. The bars here now are the height of the bromide load. So the height there is its bromide load. The bars are in the locations where the power plants are. The squares here are, again, the drinking water utilities. We're going to look at two cases. One is the case where it's baseline, just the amount of bromide that's in the coal. Then we looked at what happens if everybody decides mercury control is really important, and bromide is the cheapest, easiest way to do that. So of course, the bars get much bigger. Now, for each drinking water intake, I'm going to replace that dot with a square that is the size of the mean August flow. 
So you should notice immediately that the Ohio is a really big river. Right? Susquehanna is pretty big too. The Monongahela, poor little soul, is not. The Monongahela is a fairly low flow river with these three quite large loads in here. So you're not going to be surprised when I overload, overlay the concentrations as a gradient. Darker is higher concentration, lighter is lower concentration. The Susquehanna looks pretty OK. The Monongahela looks like it's got real problems. Right? Again, that's a combination of these significant loads and low flows. Of course, one can look at that for any flow condition and any load condition in the river. Um, and I'll do that in a second. First thing I wanted to say is you might think looking at this that EPA should have regulated these discharges for bromide. I can tell you that we thought they should have. Right? So we went back to look at the original regulation and we asked, well, what did they do? It's not like they didn't consider this. And sure enough, EPA did consider this. Here's what EPA did. They put a pin in the map where the coal-fired power plant is, and they drew an eight-kilometer circle around it. Yeah, upstream and down, whatever. They drew a circle around it, and if your drinking water utility was inside the circle, you were affected. And if your drinking water utility was outside the circle, don't worry. I mean, bromide's conservative and all that, but whatever. Inside the circle, something to worry about. So they found 150,000 drinking water consumers in the state of Pennsylvania were affected. They did this nationally. It's not very many people. We, of course, did a watershed approach, go figure. Right? We thought it was important to look at flow conditions. And we found these 22 drinking water systems, which serve 2.5 million people. Now, if you look closely, you'll notice they're not even the same people. Right? And so EPA <laughs> identified these people here who are upstream of a coal-fired power plant as being affected. And they did not identify all of the people in Allegheny County, the largest county in southwestern Pennsylvania, who are downstream of lots of power plants. The utility I showed you the data for is way outside this. It's 22 miles downstream from its nearest coal-fired power plant. It would never be considered. Some of the utilities I'll show you in, in a bit are hundreds of miles away from, these, um, from the coal-fired power plant utilities. And yet, the bromide, of course, stays in the river, being only diluted, not eliminated. So looking at the national picture, we wanted to go back then to this big national consideration and look at what happened in the different regions. We often ask ourselves in southwestern Pennsylvania if we're just really unlucky. Right, so I identify a problem and I study it, but maybe it's only here. No one else would put oil and gas wastewater into the rivers, right? And no one else would consider that these um, coal-fired power plants are nothing to worry about, right? So the first thing we asked is, is there really a problem nationally? Looking at the um, national picture, this is showing you coal use. The size of the circle is the amount of coal. And the amount of blue is whether you're wet FGD and the type of coal. So this really, really dark blue is wet FGD with refined coal, so likely the highest bromide. So yeah, to some extent, our problem is where we are. The Ohio has a lot of coal-fired power plants. It has significant use of refined coal. Even the eastern part of Pennsylvania has a fair amount of refined coal. Both of those power plants on the Susquehanna are using refined coal. But the southeastern part of the United States is not looking a whole lot better. And other bromide problems have popped up in North Carolina and South Carolina. So we wanted to take a look for, throughout the whole United States, where are these issues? So the triangle should look familiar. That's those coal-fired power plants that are operating wet FGD in the United States in 2016. The little cream-colored spots are HUC-12 watersheds that have drinking water intake. I am not showing you the drinking water intakes. You probably noticed on my Pennsylvania map they were really big circles. Drinking water intakes are sensitive information. We don't disclose the exact location of a drinking water intake. And so when EPA shared with us the national details of the drinking water intakes, the HUC-12 level is the level at which they were willing to share them with us. In Pennsylvania, um, colleagues had already ground truthed them, so we knew their locations. Um, but these are the HUC-12s that are um, in the US that have drinking water um, intakes on them. Once you do a flow analysis looking at those coal-fired power plants and those drinking water intakes, it's a considerably smaller map. Okay? So there are 230 drinking water facility watersheds potentially affected by about 80 power plants with wet FGD. That's 307 systems and about 20 million people. 
So our next question was, well, how affected are they? I mean, take a look at these power plants up here in North Dakota. That's the only thing upstream of all of those drinking water utility intakes, right? Could those two way up there really be affecting things way down here? So we did an analysis where we put those loads into the river flows, just as I've explained before, and we looked for any case where the delivery of bromide to a drinking water intake at median flow exceeded one microgram per liter. Partly we did that because we were interested in a range of flows, and we knew that the concentration at which there's de definite effects observed for cancer outcomes in people consuming the water is 10 micrograms per liter of bromide. A delta of 10 <laughs> micrograms per liter of bromide is a noticeable increase in drinking water risk. So we looked at one, we took it down in order of magnitude, and we identified any place where a power plant delivered at least one microgram per liter of bromide to a drinking water intake. First thing to recognize is that some places are not affected at all. Some areas have wet FGD, but no downstream drinking water impacts based on 2016 coal delivery information and this threshold that I mentioned of one microgram per liter. This conclusion that some places are not affected suggests that perhaps EPA was right not to write a broad ELG, but to decide that this should be done permit by permit. Generally, when it is not a broad-based implication, they don't write an ELG. They instead say it should be done permit per by permit. So it's possible, seeing that some places are not affected, that that would be what we would conclude. However, many places are affected. We wanted to understand what does it mean for one microgram per liter to be at a given drinking water intake. So if you're a drinking water utility and you serve 600 people and the bromide concentration at your intake is 30 micrograms per liter higher because of the power plant, is that the same as being 10 micrograms per, high, per liter higher and serving a million people? We wanted to get some sense of what that relative impact was. So we invented a term, we invented a vulnerability term that effectively takes the concentration being delivered at the intake and multiplies it by the population being served. That allowed us to identify highly vulnerable regions like HUC 0305, which has 14 watersheds that have drinking water intakes and five upstream wet FTDs that are affecting them. And scores a quite high 67.6 million people times microgram per liter. Right? That's not a people estimate, that's a people times concentration estimate. Similarly, if we look downstream of those two, remember those two power plants right up here? Well, sure enough, one of the most impacted watersheds is six states away where the population of the drinking water intake suddenly gets high enough that even though the bromide is significantly diluted, the impact is significant for those water users. And there we are in the Ohio. We have one of these highly vulnerable as well. One of the other things you should notice is that some of these are going to be easier to manage than others. So HUC 1030 with these people affected by two wet FGD discharges, well, that's two permits I have to write and two control points I have. And in fact, one of these two wet FGD power plants reports that they do zero liquid discharge on their FGD, in which case I should take their bromide load out. Right? I can't confirm that, which is why I didn't take the bromide load out. But you could, at these two wet FTD discharges, just say, well, no FTD from you. Right? You can't discharge wet FTD because you have this impact downstream. Whereas others are going to be more difficult. In the Ohio, where it's all those plants in the Allegheny and all those plants in the Monongahela and a whole bunch more in the Ohio itself, there are 10 discharges we would have to regulate in order to control that bromide load. Okay, so wrapping up. It would be wonderful if research problems in the public policy space just stood still long enough for us to answer the questions. But they don't, and so there have been major recent changes affecting energy-associated bromide loads. I mentioned already that PADEP stopped the discharge of partially treated oil and gas produced water from Marcellus Shale Formation. I have to say it that way because they didn't stop conventional discharges, but at least they stopped the Marcellus discharges. There are a lot of other changes that have been happening in the coal industry. So this is a look at coal, consumption, coal generating capacity and how much of it is treated in various ways. In 1991, very little wet FGD existed. We were worried about acid rain and we thought we probably should deploy wet FGD, but we hadn't done it yet. 
By 2016, the bulk of coal generating capacity in the US is either wet or dry scrubbed. However, the total amount of capacity is going down. So people often say to me, isn't this problem going to go away, right? We're using less coal. And sure enough, we are down in coal generating capacity in the US by 16%, but the amount of that capacity that's scrubbed is up 7%. Similarly, the use of refined coal is up considerably. So the application of bromide and now iodide, it will be my eternal shame if the, if the outcome of all of this research I've done is that everyone switches to iodide. <laughs> that will be really bad. Iodated DBPs are different from brominated DBPs in one major way. They are completely unregulated. Okay, so they are exactly as problematic as brominated ones, but no one measures them. So you will have a significant impact, but you won't see it. So that would not be a good outcome. So we are seeing more coal um, being scrubbed and more coal burning, um, coal, refined coal. We also have seen a number of changes around the regulatory structure. So as I mentioned, refined coal, it makes up nearly one-fifth of coal in 2017. Um, it was a little, it was a little less than 20% in 2016. Um, EPA is still trying to finalize their rule for the revision. We met with them three or four times last year to present this methodology, to show them how to replicate this methodology in case they wanted to inform their own um, regulatory structure. They also proposed changes to the MATS rule, the mercury and air toxins rule, which again may alter whether people are applying bromide for mercury control. And then my favorite, I, I often say that um, I won't tell the IRS how to collect taxes if they don't tell me how to clean the water. It is really not a great idea that this tax credit exists because it is, it is altering the choices that are being made at coal-fired power plants in ways that do not comport with risk analysis. And the reason I say that is that although the tax credit is designed to encourage you to add bromide because it improves SOX and NOx emissions, you are not required to prove that it does so. Okay, you are required to prove that under ideal conditions, your coal would reduce SOX and NOx, but you're not required to operate your plant such that it does or to confirm that it does. So that choice to have a tax credit to drive this behavior which may not be giving us cleaner air at the expense of dirtier water. It may be giving us both dirtier air and dirtier water. So that's not a great idea, but of course we're thinking of extending it. So this tax credit expires, so there should be no new coal refining facilities, but both the House and the Senate have introduced um, bills to extend it. Or I should say, they did during the 2018 Congress. Um, they haven't reintroduced them, but I do expect they will. The last big thing that's going to change the dynamic here is you could decide that wet FTD wastewater, which by the way contains a lot of things worse than bromide, that that particular waste stream, which is a very small fraction of wastewater produced at coal-fired power plants, should really not be discharged. That it really should go through a zero liquid discharge process where we remove everything, solidify it, and dispose of it in a different way. Not, by the way, putting it on the roads. Right? Like it's not a great idea to extract the salt from these wastewaters and then apply them to the roads. But ZLD is a huge market and its applications in um, coal-fired power plants were really taking off until EPA reopened the regulation. And so there's been a plateau in the deployment because of the uncertainty around the economics here with the power plant. Should I deploy um, ZLD or not, given that I don't exactly know what regulatory regime I'm going to be under? So in conclusion. I always feel silly putting these conclusions up. Coal-fired power plants and wet FTD discharges contribute to bromide concentrations in surface water. It's conservative. <laughs> if there's bromide in your wastewater, it's not surprising that putting that wastewater into the river contributes to the concentration. In the past several decades, there's been an increase in these bromide loads. Everywhere we've deployed wet FTD, we are incidentally capturing that bromide and discharging it. Everywhere we add bromide to coal for mercury control or for this tax credit, we're increasing those bromide loads in the river. Increasing bromide increases DBPs. This is another one of those conclusions that I say, well, it's not really my work. that You could have put this up 20 years ago in a slide. We know that increasing bromide in source waters increases brominated DBPs, and we know that brominated DBPs are more of a risk. Spatial temporal context really matters. Bromide is one of the few contaminants 
where you can dilute your way out of the problem. Right? Once the concentration gets low enough at the drinking water intake, it does not increase the rate and extent of DBP formation. Where you are, upstream versus downstream of one of these power plants, what else is happening in the basin in terms of other bromide discharges, whether it's a high flow or a low flow river, whether it's a drought year, that lovely result I showed you where the Susquehanna was fine was true except for 2016 when the bromide spiked from 30 micrograms per liter to 130 micrograms per liter because of a drought condition. So spatial temporal context really does matter. And there are many places in the country, in the US, where dilution will not solve this problem. Removing those loads is necessary in order to control this problem. So with that, I want to thank the five PhD students who were involved in this research. The bulk of this work is the PhD research of Kelly Good, who is, by the way, looking for a job. So in case you know, anyone's hiring. Um, Chelsea and Adam and Jushin and Jeff did a lot of work on risk and DBPs related to bromide loads, but not exclusively to power plant bromide loads. And a number of different organizations have funded this work. And both Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority and the Pennsylvania American Water have been incredibly generous with their operational data and with allowing us to bug them routinely for sampling at their water utility. And with that, I am happy to take questions. Thank you for the great talk, but sad. <laughs> I just want, I have two quick questions. One is, is there any epidemiological studies done to look at the risky areas that you identified? And second is, yes, I understand about concentration, but I'm wondering if we're missing a big one, which is accumulation, either in oh, earth oh. or on bodies. Yeah, so good question. So on the, um, on the epidemiological space, the epidemiological work around DBPs is extensive. However, exposure is very difficult to measure, right? So it's a long-term risk, and it's from consuming your drinking water. And we've been changing our treatment processes in your drinking water across your lifespan, and you also move, right? So figuring out really what someone's exposure is has been really challenging. Exposed populations or regions where total trihalomethanes are higher do show increases in these negative outcomes. Areas where the bromide concentration in the source water are higher are much more clear in the epidemiological signal. So it is likely that the brominated DBPs, although not the ones we regulate, but other brominated DBPs are likely the risk drivers. In terms of this particular population, which has had these elevated brominated DBPs for at least 30 years, I have tried to interest a few epidemiologists in coming and looking at this population since they've been exposed. However, this region has an incredibly high smoking rate and it is an old industrial region with lots of other sources. I do routinely at the university get calls from people who say, do you know about the cancer cluster near this, near this area? Well, no, I don't study cancer clusters. And like, thank you for disappointing me, right? Like, it's so depressing to get these calls of like, do you know a whole bunch of kids in this region have leukemia? No, I didn't. But it does make separating out all of those effects very difficult. One of the reasons we love studying bromide is it doesn't accumulate, right? So bromide is high, it doesn't accumulate. It's highly soluble. Um, there's been some studies of these oil and gas discharges looking at radionuclides and heavy metals, which do accumulate in the sediment downstream of these discharges. It's at relatively high levels. But bromide is soluble. It just keeps moving right on downstream. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've read the patents, but there's sort of a magic in the middle. Right, um, so the bromide, when you apply it, and under the high temperature oxi and high, highly oxidizing conditions in the coal-fired power plant, that bromide converts to bromine, which is now an oxidant, which oxidizes the mercury to a form that is now captured on the particulate on the bag house. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's not removing the mercury, right? Mercury is on the periodic table, too. We're just moving that around. But it does cause this oxidation reaction, which then makes the mercury easier to capture on the particulate side so it doesn't go up the stack. Yeah. But the, the patent does have sort of a little magic piece in the middle. Something wonderful happens at high temperature in the, yeah. Nope, oh, sorry. Yes. Um, yes, um, excellent presentation, Gene, and, and obviously, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a very serious and, uh, and wide-ranging issue. Um, one of the aspects that you focused on is the production of brominated DBPs in, in drinking water treatment plants. 
Um, given the move of the drinking water industry to using UV for disinfection more recently, I, I should know the answer to this, but in terms of uh, production of brominated DBPs, UV as, as opposed to some of the other more conventional disinfectants, that, that's the first question. The second one, is, and this is well outside the scope of what you were using, uh, or talking about rather, um, we in North America and much of the world insist that we have a disinfectant residual in our distribution systems, in the pipe networks, which means that we're adding chlorine. Um, the Netherlands, for example, hasn't done that for years and they seem to be doing just fine. Um, so we could find other ways to manage the public health issue of water quality and potential infection in the distribution systems without adding chlorine. That would also reduce the, uh, reduce the production of, of DBPs. And now, of course, bromide, bromide, there may be other issues, but we have been focusing on the DBPs. Yeah, yeah, and the focus um, is on the DBP. So you brought up two pieces, the primary disinfection, right? So if you, if you avoid chlorine for the primary disinfection and you use UV or ozone or some other technique, do you reduce your DBP formation? Absolutely. Um, uh, UV, you are not going to see these particular DBPs formed. Ozone, you're going to see bromate formed, which is also a concern. Um, the, the regulated DBPs that are organic are predominantly seen in free chlorine treating systems. So during the um, study we did here in southwestern Pennsylvania, we were looking at uh, six drinking water plants along the Monongahela River that were being affected by this. And at the end of the study, we had to eliminate two from analysis because they switched to chloramine during the study. Right? A switch to chloramine is often a solution to this problem because chloramine produces less of the regulated DBPs and more of unregulated DBPs. This is unlikely to actually change the risk profile. It may even make the risk profile worse when you get brominated nitrogen-containing DBPs, about which we know even less. Okay. But that transition, changing the disinfectant, is a common solution offered, often offered by the um, power industry. You know, the problem really is those drinking water plants. They just can't manage to produce this water. As we increase their bromide, they should be able to adapt and change disinfectants and change what they're doing, right? We have not looked at that as an outcome, although we do ask the question, often in reply to that comment, where does it make the most sense from a societal standpoint, from a cost standpoint, from a who pays standpoint? Does it make the most sense to remove the bromide from the FTD wastewater or to manage the bromide's impact at the drinking water plant? That is not an answered question. We don't know where it will be most cost effective to manage that risk. Um, but clearly, it's a trade off between your electricity prices and your water prices. Right? Somewhere you're going to pay to control this risk, assuming that you care about it. The distribution system question so we do apply chlorine in the distribution system to keep a residual all the way to your tap. That is an, a North American preference. Um, I'm a fan of it only because the pipes in Pittsburgh are older than my grandmother. And the, so the pipe contains a fair amount of biofilm and we have been feeding that biofilm for a long time with organic carbon levels that are not as low as they achieve in Europe. Could we transition to extremely low organic carbon and therefore no need for residual? Possibly, but I think we would have to distribute treatment differently. So we currently have, so in, in Pittsburgh, there's a large plant. The longest detention time in our system in Pittsburgh is 18 days. Okay, the water spends 18 days reaching, and it's sad to say, but it's my office. So it's 18 days till it gets to the campus where the university is. That's an incredibly long time to expect it to maintain quality. But you could think about putting booster stations that would increase the quality of the water out in the distribution system, maybe even just for drinking. Maybe we could distribute the water we're distributing now for fighting fires and cleaning your car and all that other stuff, but we should have booster treatment for the water that you actually are going to consume in your house. So we have a separate research project looking at how you would optimize that. You have a built infrastructure. How do you optimize the addition of those distributed treatment facilities to get us a different way of delivering water? It's not really going to change whether we include the disinfectant or not, but it could allow us to significantly control the negative impacts of the disinfection byproduct. Yep, yep. It, on the wastewater side, too, people keep talking about distributed, distributed, distributed. We're not building any of it, but we do continue to talk about it. Yeah, so lots of good questions and lots of details there. The, in, in many 
U.S. drinking water plants with DBP problems, which is a lot of them, um, optimization of coagulation occurred 20 years ago, right? So we've already done a lot of, twisting a lot of knobs to try to get as much removal of organic carbon as we can get without switching to a biological process, which is often used in Europe, right? So we don't have anything in the drinking water plant eating, any bacteria eating the organic carbon. So most of the plants that we've studied have already optimized other methods for removal of organic carbon. But we did look in the, in the work we were doing in the MON, we looked at the nature of the organic carbon to see if we could identify what was driving DBP formation. So we did a bunch of EAMS analysis, which were popular in DBP work for a while, trying to look at the nature of the organic carbon. Um, we were interested in the question of, as the climate changes in this region, how's the organic carbon profile going to change? The bromide's already changing. Am I getting to where this source water is not treatable? I can't produce a drinkable water from conventional treatment in this system. Um, we're not there yet, but we are at a point where many of these water utilities have exceeded what they're capable of doing to get cleaner water. And so, of course, we're starting to see consolidation. When you can't really meet your drinking water goals, sell the plant to someone else. And so then we get these even larger distribution systems on centralized plants. Um, so that's not a great outcome, but we're starting to see it because the smaller utilities are having more and more trouble meeting compliance. 